Welcome everyone to the Los Altos History Museum's program, <clears throat> Los Altos Goes Green. I am Dr. Elizabeth Ward, the Executive Director of the Los Altos History Museum, and um, I'm going to um, begin this evening with uh, acknowledging that the Los Altos History Museum sits on the ancestral homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, whose descendants still live in the area today. They cared for Thamien, the native name for this region, for thousands of years before their land was taken away from them. I would also like to acknowledge the volunteers, members, and staff who helped make the Los Altos History Museum a bridge between the past and the present. We are honored to have the opportunity to tell meaningful stories that help us recognize the power of the past to influence the future. We are a nonprofit organization and we welcome your support as members, volunteers, or donors. Thank you all so much for your support of this community resource. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing the museum's board president, Mr. Gary Hedden. And Gary, I did go ahead and mute you just in case there was any surprising background noises there. Um, Gary has been our, our board president for the last year and he's going to be starting on his second term as board president starting July 1st. We are so pleased with his ownership, with his leadership, particularly in the field of uh, making sure the museum is more environmentally responsible. He's uh, the president also of Greentown Los Altos and he has brought such an amazing sensitivity to the museum. He's starting a program right now to see what we can do to get ourselves closer to being green certified and he has some interns looking over all of our processes at the museum. We're very excited to have his particular passion um, helping guide the Los Altos History Museum at this time. And I want to thank you Gary for putting together this panel for us tonight. This panel is offered in support of an exhibition that we have at the Los Altos History Museum called Beauty and the Beast, Wildflowers and Climate Change, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. That exhibition is uh, brought to us by Exhibit Envoy and it will be on view at the Los Altos History Museum until July 11th. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, please do so. We have sold out of the book um, that the photographers made in conjunction with this exhibition. Um, but you can still come see the photographs yourself and, um, and we have other climate related books in the museum shop. So the Los Altos History Museum is always admission free and um, we, we welcome you to, to come by between noon and four o'clock, Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday. Thank you so much to our panelists for being with us here this evening. I'm going to turn it over to Gary to introduce um, the group he's brought together to talk to us about Los Altos Goes Green. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was very nice. Uh, one thing about the exhibit that's up right now is it's stunning photography. But when you talk to the uh, photographers and they gave a presentation, uh, they say that, yes, we are seeing some changes to California flowers. They've been doing this for 27 years, and, and but there are seasonal variations. They, they know there are changes taking place. They're seeing more 100-year blooms, which is interesting, but they don't know if they can spot a trend. And so uh, I'm asking the, the three expert panelists in their work, and they work in this field uh, of na the natural habitat, if they can see a trend. and it's not likely that they can because it's, it's these things don't happen within a normal lifetime, although we are seeing uh, more uh, warmer, hotter weather all the time. So and this year, a lot less rain. So there are some things that are going on and I'd like to hear from our panelists. So they are uh, Cody Saifuentes Winter, who is with the region, Mid Pin Regional Open Space District. And among other things, he is uh, the project manager for their wildland fire resilience program, which is, of course, of topical interest right now. It's been in the news lately. Uh, we also have Matthew Dodder, who is the executive director with the local Audubon Society. He's been passionate about uh, birds, of course, <laughs> habitat, green space, and biodiversity for many, many years. And so we'll hear what he can tell us. And then we have Dr. Stu Weiss, who is the chief scientist at uh, Creekside Science. And he's looking at how, how can we cope with 
uh, the climate changes and the environmental changes. So I'm asking the panelists to give us uh, a few minutes about what they are working on and what they're passionate about. And then uh, well, maybe if, if they can, what, what can we do is, is one, one takeaway for, uh, for this talk. Uh, I mean, I, I ride a bike, I, I've got birdhouses, I planted milkweed. So there are some things that I've been able to do, uh, but in general, what can we do? And so uh, it's gonna be a conversation. There are no slides tonight, no slideshows, but I suspect that with this group of three wonderful people, we will have a, a very spirited conversation. And you are allowed and welcome to enter into this. Use the chat function, uh, write a question or a comment, and I will try to keep an eye on that and, and ask it at the appropriate time. But basically, I'm turning it over to the, the three panelists to have some fun and lead us through an interesting 90 minutes. So I'm going to kick it off by asking Cody. It's alphabetical. Just go down the line. Uh, tell us what you're doing and what you're passionate about. Sure. Uh, thank you so very much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, as, as you mentioned, you know, I, I work for Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and I've been there for about six years. And prior to that, I was with the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service, uh, going all over uh, the U.S. doing a lot of habitat restoration. So um, I, I do a lot of vegetation work, a lot of ecology um, and uh, at MidPen, um, you know, we've helped to protect about 65,000 acres um, throughout um, three uh, counties, the San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz counties. Um, we have 26 open space preserves that we take care of. And one of the things that I am probably most passionate about, um, besides just looking at the pretty flowers, um, is, is really um, doing inventory and monitoring of our rare species that we have. Um, you know, California is one of, I believe it's 36 biological hotspots throughout the world. Um, it has an amazing abundance of biodiversity. Um, it's absolutely just, just absolutely amazing to me. And to know that, you know, I get paid to count flowers and play in the dirt um, <laughs> is it, just absolutely amazing. So um, I really love getting out there and uh, doing the inventory and monitoring, counting those flowers and seeing how they're doing um, over time. Okay, uh, Matthew, tell us what you're up to. Unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Gary, uh, for in, inviting me and, and the rest of us. It's quite an honor to be here tonight, so thank you. Um, I am now starting my third year as executive director at Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Uh, my career before that was very different, but I've been a birder since 1977, which is the bulk of my life. I've always been passionate about birds. I've been all over the world uh, looking birds. And uh, for the past 21 years, I've been teaching about birds at Palo Alto Adult School. And when I moved to Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, I moved my classes there. So at the chapter, we have kind of three pillars to our mission, uh, conservation, education, and birding. So birding is fairly obvious. We have uh, free field trips for uh, members and non-members to attend. Uh, during the non-COVID pandemic uh, period. We're just opening up the field trips now. Uh, we have an enormous and very important conservation uh, uh, segment run by Shani Kleinhaus, who many of you probably already know her. She was instrumental in, in helping to uh, save uh, Coyote Valley uh, and preserve the North Coyote Valley in particular, where we have an upcoming education program, which is focusing on uh, high schoolers uh, on underserved communities in uh, mid-county. So there are lots of opportunities for people to volunteer, uh, whether it's uh, docents on field trips or uh, instructors uh, for a wetlands discovery program or the upcoming uh, Oak Savannah Community Science Project in Coyote Valley. And we just do a lot of, uh, a, a lot of different activities. Uh, we have a wonderful website filled with rich media, videos, uh, speaker series, etc. And we can get more into details later, but uh, that's, that's what I do. And I, I have to say, uh, this is the best job I've ever had. I love <laughs> what I do. I love what I get paid to talk about. Uh, it's my greatest passion is birds and wildlife. Well, that's great, Matthew. And, and you, they do have a wonderful website, by the way. So be sure to check that out. But we'll talk about that more later, maybe as well. Uh, let's see, uh, Stu. Okay, well, uh... I'm like Cody. I, I get to count wildflowers and butterflies. 
Um, I'm a conservation ecologist. I came out of Stanford University. I was there for about 20 years in various capacities and then started working on my own in 1999 um, and formed Creekside Science, which is a very small firm. There's a total of five of us. And we get to do what I consider to be kind of the cream of the crop of fun uh, conservation and restoration work. Um, at a really fine scale, will uh, restore endangered plant populations meter by meter. Uh, then we're working on, uh, we've been working on Coyote Ridge with the bait checker spot butterfly and the serpentine grasslands and like the most absolutely amazing wildflower display in the world. Um, been down there since 1984. Uh, again, working with the bait checker spot butterfly. Um, and then at a broadest scale, I'm, uh, I've been the, the science advisor to uh, what's now called Together Bay Area, which used to be the Bay Area Open Space Council. And we worked, been working since 2006 on a project called the Bay Area Conservation Lands Network, which is kind of a conservation inventory and vision for conserving half the Bay Area by 2050, um, you know, half Bay Area. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of a consortium of groups like Midpen, um, East Bay Parks, all the park districts. And that's really amazing because I know the biogeography of the Bay Area probably better than anybody as a whole because I'm the filter through which all the science goes. <laughs> so um, it's it just, it, you know, it's, you know, like, like the two other panelists, you know, it's the best job in the world. That's great. Uh, I, let's follow up a little bit on that. Uh, if we could set aside half the Bay Area, wouldn't that be uh, make a dramatic difference? And how, how would that look and feel? Well, uh, go to the website, bayarealands.org and read all about it. We wrote everything down. Um, it's a well-funded project, so there's a lot of good documentation. It, would, it will have like a substantial single, a large area of con contiguous area of conserved land in each of the mountain ranges in the Bay Area. And it will be, uh, and those large areas will be representative of the vegetation diversity and we'll cover all the rare species. We specifically target those. It will flesh out the existing protected lands. So there's a, there's a big uh, push nationwide and in California, it's called 30 by 30, which is conserving 30% of the landscape by 2030. Well, we're ahead of the game. We hit 30 by 20. We did the math. And 30% of the uh, land area of the 10 counties, the greater Bay Area, um, is protected by fee title or easement. Now, whether it's being managed appropriately, that's, that's the whole other, you know, that, that's the frontier on conservation in the Bay Area. I think, Cody, you know, I see you're nodding there. It's just... It's one thing to set aside the land and make sure it doesn't get built on. Absolutely essential step, but boy, there's so what much first step. <laughs> it. you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, a first step, and it's one of the probably the bigger challenges for, for us is um, maintaining um, what has been there for so long um, in the absence of um, you know certain biological processes that are completely natural that we've stopped um, and so uh, I'm mostly talking about fire. You know, there's a lot of, you know, the fire process that we've stopped and that has led to a lot of different um, opportunities for us to, to rise up and to take care of the land in a, in a different way um, to make sure that we're maintaining this area. Tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the, your efforts with fire resiliency. Uh, yeah, so um, about three years ago, um, I was requested to start looking at doing prescribed fire in the Bay Area again. Um, and we started working on that. Um, and um, it came to our attention pretty quickly that um, that was just one small piece of what we needed to do, actually, 
um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so um, I was tasked with making a more holistic program. Um, and so we, we developed the Wildland Fire Resiliency Program um, for uh, Mid-Peninsula um, Regional Open Space. Um, we worked with, I don't even know how many different agencies and partner agencies, um, consultants, um, the community. Uh, I think we did 15 public meetings to get everybody's input um, on this. And so uh, our focus is, uh, you know, we came up with these different plans that make up the program. Uh, the first plan um, is our vegetation management plan. So this is uh, working in areas that um, might need additional assistance um, to allow CAL FIRE or other responding agencies to get in and out of our land or to get in and out of neighborhoods. Um, so this is a small percentage actually of our land that we manage. The bigger portion is uh, what we call for ecosystem resiliency. So uh, these are uh, doing vegetation management in areas that haven't seen fire or haven't seen uh, management in a while. And so uh, this is to help us prioritize these areas and go in and do some management in those areas. Um, the other aspect of that of the program, um, we do have prescribed fire portion, which we're um, still developing now. Um, we also have what we call pre fire plans and um, advisor maps. And so these are maps that um, show the existing conditions on our lands that we provide to fire agencies. Um, and they show them, um, you know, where can they drive vehicles on our land? Where are gates at? Uh, where are water sources of water that they might be able to use? Um, and also the natural resources that we need to protect. So uh, we might show four different ponds in an area, but we'll say, hey, we don't want you to draw from this pond because it has an endangered species there. Can you please pull from this pond over here? We also show them, hey, here's a great place to put in a dozer line. If there was a fire, it would have the least amount of impact on the natural resources if we put it here. Um, and that might be because of cultural resources that we know that are on the land that we want to protect, that we, you know, there's no reason to put a bulldozer through a cultural site if we can just move that bulldozer line 200 yards down the way. So we're trying to do all that pre-work um, for the fire agency. So when something happens, we can make really good decisions with really good data. But you have done some fire breaks already and have they been tested? Um, yeah, so we, uh, we currently do about 500 um, acres a year of fire work. Um, this could be disc lines, shaded fuel breaks, non-shaded fuel breaks. Um, you know, just recently, uh, two years ago, we completed a shaded fuel break at Saratoga Gap, uh, which is up on Highway 35 near uh, at the crossroads of Highway 9. Um, and we had stalled a shaded fuel break um, about two years ago with Cal Fire. Um, and, you know, we did have a, a lightning or not a lightning, I'm sorry. Uh, we did have a fire strike, uh, a fire start there. Um, this was last week. Um, and uh, Cal Fire said that due to the shaded fuel break that was there, it was extremely slow moving and that they were able to catch up to it and get it out within 45 minutes. So um, it just showed that, you know, doing a little bit of this work can really go a long way. So that one worked. That's that's good news. So you'll be con continuing to do more of that. Yeah. So uh, we're we're in the process of um, you know we've prioritized our work that we're going to be doing for the next about two years so far uh, in conjunction with fire agencies uh, to determine where we're going to be doing uh, this vegetation management work and actively pursuing grants. Um, we actually just received um, Cal uh, Cal Fire grant. Um, for uh, the Lexington uh, Basin area. So that's near Los Gatos. Um, and that is in conjunction with three other um, agencies. Um, and it's for $7.5 million that we're gonna be doing forest health uh, throughout that area. Okay. Uh, let me toss it over to Matthew for a second. Uh, we all love watching birds. And I think that's part of the fascination is of birds are fascinating. So they become a good indicator species if something goes south with a bird, so to speak, uh, we notice it because we're paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. What if, and especially yeah, what have you seen? Well, especially now, uh, let's talk about the fire for just a moment. Uh, you know, we were uh, uh, all shocked and horrified with the damage on Mount Hamilton in the neighboring San Antonio Valley. All of our members or many of our members are avid eBird users. So what we're doing is we're kind of creating um, an informal database of the birds that are there 
and any kinds of decline that they've experienced. And we're um, using various hotspots to uh, take notice of when birds reappear in certain areas. My feeling is that uh, my first thought is after the fire that this bird, this wonderful birding habitat had sort of been completely destroyed and that it was now a wasteland, birdless. Uh, and, you know, of course, that's not correct. There's still life there. And the important opportunity for us as citizen scientists is to uh, observe the recovery of the area, to document it. Now, this, these are not necessarily scientific uh, surveys, but they are helpful in, in, a, in a manner of speaking. And if it gets people out there excited to see the birds, excited to monitor their, their recovery, then I'm all for that. Now, uh, with regard to surveys and such, you know, we've had our uh, Christmas bird count for 75 years in Santa Clara County. And for 40 years, we've been doing the summer bird count. And we've noticed trends and declines in many species and, and increases in other species. So uh, we're kind of, we're, we're taking note of that and we're trying to figure out what can we possibly uh, ascribe uh, to these declines and increases as far as, is it climate related? Is it fire related? Is it drought related? Is it all three? Is it something else? So, uh, you know, our membership uh, we keep track of where the birds are, and we notice when they're declining. We notice when they, when they show up late, uh, or whether they're, when their nests succeed or fail. And because of our work with cavity nesters, because of our work with uh, the uh, Christmas count and summer bird count, we're in a good position to make note of those things. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell how we notice things, and just a couple of things that we have noticed. Mm -hmm. We've also kind of uh, made some predictions about what we can expect in the years ahead. Some are good and some are bad. Uh, and we can yeah, talk I wanna, I'd like to make a pitch for the bird atlas of Santa Clara County. Um, I work You're right here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just an amazing document. Every grid square in the county yeah, is, this, has been this, surveyed. Uh, and was masterminded by Bill Bowsman, who's the, the major author, but there are many dozens of people involved with it. Uh, it's a it's a massive, wonderful, authoritative book. It's a seminal and work on Santa Clara County. It's going to be updated at some point. I mean, it's a huge yeah. Amount of work. But. Yeah. In any case, uh, just to put in a plug for membership to Audubon, this does actually come free with your membership. So I just had to say that. <laughs> Good for you. I'm a, I, I, just have to say that, <laughs> I just have to say that, that the work that the Audubon Society does and the, the people that go out and do these monitoring um, and seeing what they see, it is so invaluable to land uh, managers uh, to really know what's going out there. You know, like I said earlier, 65,000 acres. Uh, there's one of me. I have, you know, three mm -hmm. botanists that work for me. Um, but we cannot survey all that area all the time. And when people are going out um, using apps like iNaturalist or CalFlora, and they're, they're making these, um, these observations, you know, the, they become the eyes and ears for me. And I really rely on this data to know, oh, hey, you know, someone saw this, uh, you know, is that a concern? Is that something I need to know about? And I can dispatch somebody to, to that area if I need to, to take a look at this. So, you know, citizen science, um, I'm not the greatest um, advocate of that word because it makes it sound like it's not like, you know, it's, it's lesser than science and it's really not. It is so helpful, uh, more than what most people realize. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the term community science. I was I was just going to term. say that we've been we've been shifting our usage of that term to community. So we, yeah. Yeah. I, I found citizen science sounded a little daunting, like you really had to be a scientist. But you know, and, and so I was skeptical, but I, I did a bio blitz with uh, grassroots ecology recently. And so it was four days of, of just recording everything, not just flowers and butterflies, but plants and trees and bugs. And I, the power of this is that you get millions of people doing this oh, yeah. and, and suddenly it starts to make a lot of sense and it helps people, like you said, you're a small group and five people, Cody. And so you actually get on your iNaturalist app and, and, and you can 
you can be helpful out there, citizen scientists. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What, what, I mean, it's all peer reviewed too. So uh, there's there's a real accuracy that goes along with iNaturalist. We're using that more and more. And the program I mentioned before, the, the Oak Savannah uh, Community Science Program, uh, a large part of that will be uh, iNaturalist based. And you know, one of the cool things about iNaturalist too, I have a lot of botanist consultants that actually use iNaturalist um, it has been tracking now when things are going into bloom and when they're not. Um, and so you can actually see if something, because of everybody putting in their data, you know, hey, in February, end of February, you can go out and see um, Durka occidentalis, Western leatherwood, that is like the prime time that it's in bloom. And I can actually monitor phenology um, based off of iNaturalist and be like, okay, people are trying to see this, time for me to send out my botanists uh, to go survey these. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really tough species to pick out when it's not in bloom. It just blends totally in. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, just anything that gets people out into nature observing um, is just intrinsically worthwhile. It to me, it, it, it like activates a lot of you know our instinctual. Uh, ability to deal with biodiversity because that was our survival skill for, you know, for evolutionary history to know like when and where like a flower is going to be in bloom so we can harvest the seed at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I, I did want to go back to one quick thing back to the fire issue. Um, you know, we have to realize that uh, the Spanish and then the Anglos, you know, we came into a what is a, a highly tended landscape by the indigenous people that they figured out over thousands of years how to make a really good living from the native vegetation. And we, you know, we, we took that over and we didn't really understand how to maintain it. And we're, we've gotten ourselves in a pretty deep hole in terms of things like fire management. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to see um, kind of a rebirth of that you know, traditional ecological knowledge. It's, you know, that's one of the things we, you know, one of the buzzwords we tend to use a lot, but, you know, but realizing that fire is an intrinsic part of our landscape. Mm -hmm. And one more thing on fire, what we saw last year was basically the pre-human fire regime around here. Every decade or two, we get a big dry lightning storm, sets fires up all over the place. And before there were people trying to stop them, they would just burn for you know months. Hmm. So uh, it kind of gave us a flavor of what the you know, the, the longer term evolutionary pressure on the landscape, um, you know, until the, the indigenous people showed up, you know, at the end of the ice age. So um, it's something really important to keep in mind when you talk about natural fire regimes. Um, that, that goes back a really long time. Did the indigenous people do more than these smaller controlled burns? I, I suspect they were controlled. Was there other vegetation management? Well, they have, they have like a really great system that they figured out where, you know, you burn on like a seven year rotation because the first year you get, you know, seed crops, you know, and then, then good basketry material shows up and, oh. you know, then you get like the shrubs put out a huge amount of, uh, of fruit. And, you know, they, they really had it dialed in <laughs> okay. um, just through empirical, you know, empirical experience and an oral history and a culture that was completely focused on, you know, taking care of, you know, Mother Earth. Okay. Yeah. So, so Cody, when you talk about vegetation management, uh, what, elaborate on that a little bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, vegetation management, it can take a bunch of different forms. Um, you know, we do at, at MidPen, about 40% of all of our work is through volunteers, actually, um, in terms of vegetation management. And that's 
almost exclusively focused on invasive species. So um, I hear a lot of people throw around the word invasive species. Uh, they don't quite understand sometimes what that sort of means. And it doesn't mean a, a species that showed up here that is not native. Um, it is a subset of those species. So we're talking the, um, you know, the two to 5% of all the species that are here that are doing um, ecological damage to an area. Those are the ones that we focus in on. So there, you know, we have some 5,000 different species um, in the Bay Area. Um, you know, the vast majority of those are, are native, actually. Um, a good portion are non-native, but a small sliver, um, you know, probably a hundred, I would say, um, are really the ones that we really focus in on. And so uh, our volunteers will go in and, and really assist us with our, our manual removal. So use of uh, picks, um, using um, what we call weed wrenches to pull out the, I'm sure everybody knows, French broom. Um, so doing that sort of work. Um, and then we also do a lot of mechanical work. So that could be brush cutters, that could be um, a, a mower, um, we sometimes will use what we call a jaws implement. It's a little, um, an arm that goes onto a tractor that can grab a, a bush and, and pull it out by its roots. Um, so th those are sort of the vegetation management techniques that we use a lot of. Um, and then of course, you know, depending on how much we're doing, uh, we might be bringing in chainsaws uh, for those invasive trees. So uh, we like to focus in on the trees that are not only invasive, but also fire prone. So we're talking about eucalyptus trees. Uh, we're talking about acacia trees. Um, and these trees, uh, you know, they're quite big and can create a lot of biomass. Um, so uh, that's another whole other issue of, you know, what do we do with all this biomass once uh, we do that? Um, so that's the vegetation management that we that we do um, in terms of invasive removal. But we also uh, will come in and look at you know doing restoration work, so seeding in some of the local natives or planting out natives um, where appropriate. Okay, well that's certainly what grassroots ecology is doing at Redwood Grove, for example, and, and other places. They took out the the invasives, in particular the ivy, and they put in a lot of others and taking care of them and. Giving them a little bit of water, <laughs> even this year, keep them going. Yeah, uh, you know, grassroots ecology, we, we do work with them quite, quite a lot. Um, they've been um, working at one of our sites called Henry's Creek. Uh, they've done an amazing job with their volunteers and their interns um, out at that site, doing a lot of great work out there, pulling invasives, planting natives, um, and, and also providing that education to those people to, to connect them a little bit more to the land. Okay. I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on what Cody was saying. Uh, grassroots Ecology is right next door to us at McClellan Ranch. So we see them every day. Oh, okay. uh, fantastic work that they do. Um, but one of the things that uh, Ann Heppenstall, one of our, one of our uh, uh, gleaming volunteers and a native plant advocate, was talking about you know, everyday citizens that can have a real impact um, in their own gardens. Uh, planting, planting natives and pollinators there, of course, is just as important as it is in planting in public lands. In fact, sometimes you could argue that it's more important to get these little, these little uh, uh, bird safe habitats uh, going, uh, particularly for pollinators. It is important. And if you get enough of them strung together, it, it provides a passageway for them. Ex exactly. Um, but I. Uh, Oh, so we're also, you know, our uh, Shiny Klein House, our environmental advocate, is working uh, really strongly with cities, uh, Palo Alto, Mountain View, Sunnyvale, San Jose, et cetera, to get uh, more natives uh, used in parks and get the correct natives used in these areas. I mean, you can, you can plant an oak anywhere, but it's not always going to survive every place. So you really need to understand where to put them. And that's where, that's where you come in, Cody. Uh, you know, to find out where they all, where they should be. But that's something we're really trying hard to do with cities, working with them to create green spaces that include natives as part of their city plans. Yeah, there's an amazing vision put out by the San Francisco Estuary Institute called Re-Oaking Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend you check it out. It basically, the idea is to recreate the oak savanna overstory that used to be all across the valley floors. Those valley oaks are just amazing trees. Uh, you know, you get shade in the summer, you get light in the winter. Mm -hmm. They store more carbon than anything except redwood trees. 
Okay. And the idea of having like this network of native trees and understory shrubs would make the urban areas so much more friendly to wildlife. And, yeah. and you know, so, so that, that I highly recommend people uh, take a look at that. Well, Greentown Los Altos has a campaign to plant 500 trees. And one of the trees that I really love to plant is the valley oak for all the reasons that you mentioned. But it's a big tree, so it's, it's not suitable for yeah, a mean, lot of homes. It's got to be the right tree in the right place. That's right. I've got one a I wanted to get in bef before we moved on to a different topic. Um, you know, the, the idea of eucalyptus, eucalyptus is actually utilized by a lot of wintering birds uh, because of the flowers. So even though it's not native, it has a value. And I, I think you could say the same thing about the fennel that's growing all the way on the roadsides. Uh, in, in, in incredible magnet for migrant warblers and flycatchers. Uh, so I've got mixed feelings about those plants in particular because I see they've got real value. Um, and if we if we took them out, are we ready? Are we prepared? Uh, are we financed to put in the, the other natives that would do a better job that actually do belong here? Okay, so don't rip them out with that. So, I have to say that you know that's very very important to consider. And um, you know I'm not an advocate for the wholesale removal of you know all invasives all the time or anything like that. Um, and it's something that we take very seriously, especially along the coast where uh, the potential for like overwintering um, sites for like monarchs. Um, this is something that is, you know, very dear to my heart too. And, um, you know, we want to make sure uh, when we are doing vegetation management that there's not unintended consequences um, to the work that we're doing. And so to, to make sure that we're, we're viewing that in a holistic way and not um, just viewing it as a one thing of like, it's not a black and white picture. Um, and that's something that um, we really want to make sure people understand. This is not a black and white thing that every single thing um, that's invasive we have to take out right now. And uh, there is also a, a timing issue, you know, uh, uh, fennel does a great job for a lot of different pollinators, uh, provides a great food source for them. Um, so, uh, you know, when we do a lot of vegetation management, we were talking about that earlier, um, you know, one of the big things that I'm an advocate for is making sure that we have a, what we call a refugia, uh, an area that we're going to leave untouched nearby that we're working that wildlife will have a place for them um, to, to use um, and making sure that um, you know we don't want to we don't want to go uh, swing the pendulum too far the other way um, and have a bunch of unintended consequences. Okay so Cody you just teed up the monarch butterfly and eucalyptus issue. I've been working with that <laughs> since 1990 and you know the monarch butterflies you know, pre you pre Anglo, uh, probably all used to go to the Monterey Peninsula where you have a pine oak forest and you know provides the right microclimate conditions. Then we planted eucalyptus all along the coast. Well, the monarchs are really opportunistic, and it's like, hey, this is a great place to spend the winter. I got wind shelter, I got light, nice mild coastal environment. So. Uh, by accident, these forests created the right structure. And now we're in this age where, wow, you know, we got to start managing these forests. So, you know, I've worked out methods for doing designer monarch habitat to make sure that the trees are in the right configuration to create the right micro microclimate conditions. And, you know, the monarchs made their choice and we have to honor it, you know, it's just... We can't impose our ideas of, you know, if we want monarch butterflies, we have to accept and manage non-native eucalyptus trees along the coast. Hmm. So, of course, now we don't, we have hardly any overwintering monarchs, but I could spend the next hour talking about that one, but. Well, I had one in my backyard a month ago, so they're not completely gone. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they've actually turned into resident year-round monarchs in oh, is that a it? lot of su suburbs. Yeah, so the migratory gen the migratory phenomenon is just hanging on by a shoestring. Well, they have but, to cross the Central Valley, which is a big challenge. Yeah, pesticide city. So, Matthew, I've got a question in the chat box about urban light pollution. I imagine that it bothers the birds. Can you speak oh, to that? Yeah, light pollution is a serious problem, and uh, we produced a, well, we do a, a lot of uh, presentations about uh, light pollution, 
and uh, particularly those electric uh, billboard bulletin boards billboards oh. oh is that right yeah so the what happens is that the brilliant light attracts uh the birds to it and they get blinded they collide uh, they get off track uh, they're pulled off of their normal route uh, the earth wants to be dark at night and that's what the that's what the animals the plants need it's what they're used to it's what they evolved to live with and uh, when we disrupt that and we create a light polluted environment that's almost as bright as day we're interfering with the hormonal activities of the birds their breeding cycles their migratory patterns uh, their interaction with each other um, their singing uh, so basically it messes everything up if they have too much light and these large-scale light projects uh, throughout the country, there's one uh, being considered for San Jose. Yes. Uh, bad idea, very yep. bad idea. Uh, and for a number of reasons, not all of which have to do with the environment. So just just uh, socially, it's a, it's a bad issue to, to invest that much money in a project like that that's ultimately going to kill thousands of birds. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the, the light pollution at night is a very serious issue. We talk about it a lot. Shiny Kleinhaus has become an expert on that issue. Uh, we have, uh, we're working on a video right now, which will go on our website. There are videos available where she and her volunteers have been speaking on the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, we care a lot about it. Okay, so yeah, as the, impact, the impact on insects, especially moths, is just huge. Yeah, and I, since you mentioned insects, and earlier you mentioned grass uh, as being a bad year for grass, I believe uh, you, Stuart, said, uh, some, of the, some of the declines in, in species, bird species, that we're seeing are insectivores. And we're noticing that so that coincides with uh, you know, the, uh, the trends that we've seen, these downward trends coincide with the reduction in the number of insects and it particularly burrowing owls at Shoreline and Alviso, very bad year for grass. Ergo, the, the grasshoppers and crickets that they rely on for their food aren't there in the numbers. Uh, so the success rate of their nests uh, declines. Um, and because there's less grass, there's more predation on these, on these rare birds. Hmm. Just one example of a kind of a, a domino effect brought about possibly by climate change, but certainly by a number of, of things. You're muted, Cody. Thank you. <laughs> if I could just go back really quickly to the, the lighting issue. Um, you know, one of a, a great citizen science app, I'm gonna start using community science, sorry. Uh, what, a great app for people to check out is called Loss of the Night. Um, and uh, what it does is you go out with the app um, it um, directs you with your smartphone to different stars that you just say if you could see it or not. And then it tells you how much light pollution is there and it uploads it to the web for, for scientists to use to see how light pollution is being affected across the globe. It's really, really cool. It's a, a, a great app to, to try to use and, and see, see what it is. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, you know, the, there's uh, the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. Um, they have a model lighting ordinance um, that they really advocate for cities to, um, to, to take a look at and to adapt or to adopt into their city ordinances. Um, so I'd really highly recommend um, if, you're, if you're interested in, in the lighting at your community uh, to take a look at that, that lighting ordinance and um, you know, bring it to the attention of um, those people that are in power that might be able to uh, assist with uh, light pollution. I think the city of Cupertino did something along those lines. Uh, yeah, and um, right now uh, Los Gatos is going through their general plan update, um, and uh, they, that is one of the things that they're looking at is about light pollution. Yeah, Los Altos is going through uh, a revision of the climate action plan. Uh, the original one from 2013 need, needs some updates, and that's fine. And so maybe we should incorporate that aspect in there and get, get them working on it. Yeah, you can, you can shooting, guarantee that shooting so. photons up into the sky is a total waste of energy. <laughs> That's right. Well, people have been asking, what can we do as individuals? So that would be uh, one thing, get, get active with some of these uh, 
things. And do you have any yeah. advice for K to A school garden educators? That's one of the questions coming up here. What should we be teaching our kids? Um, how to grow food and how to <laughs> landscape with native plants. You know, uh, growing food is just, it's so satisfying to, you know, eat that squash that came from your garden. Of course, you know about so the, uh, the living classroom project here and in, in started in a lot of school gardens. It's school um, gardens and the kids really do enjoy that. And you can incorporate a lot of other lessons in with it, history as well as science. And, yeah, and, and native, native plant landscaping. I know um, my, my daughter doesn't eat tomatoes except for the ones that grow at her school garden. Um, so uh, it, it does delicious. work. <laughs> they are delicious. Um, uh, and I, I, I think uh, the importance about pollinators is another great one for people to hear about, um, to, to understand that, um, you know, there's a, a huge connection between the insects and the birds that we have here, um, our plant life and our food. There's this the, a great connection that we have to really understand that um, things don't grow by themselves. Um, they, they're not stuck in their own little vacuum that, um, you know, uh, uh, ecology is very intertwined. It's, it's, uh, there's so many different moving parts and uh, just a basic understanding of pollinators, uh, the pollinators that we have out here, um, what, they, what, they, um, what they use and how they help us, um, you know, almonds, uh, I, I, I don't think we'd have any almonds if we didn't have any pollinators. So um, it's something to really think about is how do we protect these pollinators? Because in essence, by protecting them, we're also protecting our food source. We're also protecting our native wildlife and wild um, flowers. Yeah, I could not agree with you all more. I mean, it, what you said, Stuart and Cody, uh, about introducing uh, young kids to uh, growing food, the importance of pollinators, of course, you know, what I have to add to that, of, of course, is birds. Birds take an important part of pollinating as well. And uh, the birds rely on insects. We rely on insects indirectly because they pollinate our food, the majority of it. So it's extremely important. And my kind of mantra has always been to teach the children to, uh, to care, and they will. So you, you teach them about birds, you teach them about flowers, pollinators, plants, food, they care about it. And ultimately they grow up and vote differently. So they'll vote to support environmentally positive policies. Uh, and I, that's, that's sort of my approach to it. The more you know, the more you care, the more you care, the more you act. Okay, that's great. So I've got another question in here. It's kind of related to this, this thread where, you know, the grass isn't there, so the, so the insects aren't there, so maybe the mice aren't there, so then maybe the, the predators that eat the mice, like the owls and hawks. So one person says, uh, this is in Los Altos, the Cooper hawks that normally arrive in May didn't show up, but then uh, they just got, came today. So what's going on? Well, you know, the arrival dates and the, the nesting dates of birds is changing. It's hard, to, it's hard to detect a real pattern, and it's even harder to say that it's due to climate change. But we have to admit that there's a possibility. Um, there are other things involved. Uh, the availability of food, where they came from, were the conditions better there? Uh, were they were taking a year off? Uh, are they actually going to nest this year? Will it succeed? It's, it's, very, it's very complicated, but um, we are seeing changes in nesting dates and we're certainly seeing changes in success of nests. Uh, many, many birds are, are declining uh, because their nests are failing. The birds are not always finding the food they require. This is generally for the insectivores, tree swallows, cliff swallows, etc. Uh, you know, inclement weather, uh, weather uh, badly affects their ability to find food. Uh, ground feeders like bluebirds are done uh, really, really well. They're insectivores also, but they eat uh, ground dwelling insects. And uh, the cavity nesters program, I think, is responsible for an amazing increase in the number of uh, the number of uh, bluebirds that have successfully been found in our area. This is a 40-year sample here. Uh, well, I just saw four of them last week in my area, so that, that's pretty exciting. And you look at aerial insectivores and you see the exact opposite situation. Oh boy. So yeah. this is this is olive-sided uh, flycatcher which uh, winters in Brazil. So, so not only do you have to think about what's happening here, you've got to think about what's happening in the wintering uh, 
range as well. Okay, so I want to jump back to the grass issue. Um, one of the biggest problems out in our wildlands and our grasslands is too much non-native annual grass. It smothers the uh, wildflowers, keeps the native perennial grasses from recruiting, creates this huge thatch buildup, and is a major fire hazard. But it's being driven by smog. Hmm. Smog is fertilizer. So these areas in South San Jose, where I do a lot of work on these very nutrient poor serpentine soils that are filled with wildflowers, um, the annual grasses completely take them over because they're getting 10 to 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year coming in from the smog. Uh, this was, you know, one of those science discoveries that was just like, wow, <laughs> no idea that was happening. But um, we were able to leverage that into uh, the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan. Um, you know, which is a 50-year habitat conservation plan and natural communities conservation plan that's targeting the, you know, like 19 of the imperiled species in Southern Santa Clara County, including the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly and other plants of the serpentine grassland. And this, this is like big, the least known environmental change that, uh, you know, it's, it's like the biggest environmental change that nobody's ever heard of, but it's really, really serious. And we in Santa Clara County are on the forefront of, you know, uh, addressing it in terms of habitat management. Now, the way we manage the habitat is by grazing cows because cows eat grass. So, you know, it's it, it just, it's such a crazy new world in the 21st century and you know we're finding that we have to use you know keep an open mind about what's maintaining the biodiversity out there in a world where we're dumping nitrogen on the climate is going crazy with you know whiplash from cold to warm from dry to wet and uh you know we're along for this crazy ride but we have to, uh, you know, we have to use every tool available to us. So um, I highly recommend uh, checking out the, it's called the, the uh, Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan. Um, well, you're pleased, of course, I imagine that we're switching fairly quickly to electric cars. Yes, yeah, that's gonna make a huge difference in air quality. Um, well, we saw that last year, didn't we? The air quality mm -hmm. was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, the pandemic's yeah, a high price to pay, but wow, it was. Yeah, but then the fires kicked in, and <laughs> yeah. that's true. Yeah, the orange skies. Yeah, that was a really unexpected um, discovery, Stuart, about the smog. Uh, yeah, and we leveraged it into about seven hundred million dollars worth of mitigation. It, it, it kind of drives home the idea that finding the actual cause of a change isn't always what you think it's going to be. Yeah. It's sometimes really unexpected like, like that. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, in ecology, we call that the cascade effect. Um, and, um, you know, it's been theoretically talked about a lot and we do see it in action sometimes. You know, there was the um, where the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone is like the biggest example of this, where uh, the, the reintroduction of wolves ended up um, correcting um, how rivers run. And mm -hmm. it's all connected by what the wolves feed on and what those animals feed on. And the, you how, know, they, it, how they keep the elk moving around so the elk don't just sit there in the riparian <laughs> zone munching yeah. down the aspens and cottonwoods. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the, it's really interesting these these um, you know I talked earlier about the unintended consequences and just um, you know humans think we are extremely smart and we know everything about nature and um, the fact of the matter is uh, we don't you know and um, you know I've gone through a lot of education I know Matthew's gone through a lot of education I know you know Stu's gone through and um, it's uh, it's interesting because as a land manager. 
I have to make decisions a lot of times on just a little bit of information. So I get to look at the tip of the iceberg and make management decisions. Um, and it's because we don't know all the science. Um, and that's why it's so important that we continue to monitor what we're doing when we're doing land management, um, including um, you know, getting out there and knowing what species we have out there and how are they doing, um, you know, going full circle back to iNaturalist and, you know, needing those eyes and ears out there um, because it helps us refine what we're doing and making sure that we are um, doing more good than we are doing impacts to the natural resources. So that's, that's the idea here is we have a bunch of tools at our disposal. We want to do the, the best we can for the environment with the least amount of impact. That's great. Positive. So let me get back to uh, what we can do. I mean, the community science is certainly one thing. And I know that Matthew talked about things that uh, where volunteers can be helpful with um, with his operation. But uh, what can we do here in Los Altos? Let's make it, make it hyper local. We don't have any wolves here. So um, join a local environmental organization like Committee for Green Foothills or Audubon because that magnifies your voice um because people like you know individual people or small groups of people can have a huge impact on a local or regional scale so for example when we were agitating for the valley habitat plan we put together a coalition of you know uh committee for green foothills native plant society audubon sierra club uh you know, a few others. And um, because, because the decision making was close to us, we had a, a huge impact on the decision making. So, you know, that that's really, really important to be able to amplify your voice in conjunction with other like minded people. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Get get involved with local politics. Um, you know, get your voice heard, uh, which I think is what you what you're getting at. Uh, um, our organization has a strong um, advocacy effort, uh, environmental uh, uh, action committee, and we send out alerts. People respond to those alerts. People attend city council meetings. All kinds of issues come up: native plants, uh, land use, light projects. They're all talked about in council meetings at one point or another. And uh, get yourself in there, talk about it. Well, yeah, I, was, I was the project manager for our wildland fire resiliency program. Um, there is no way I could have gotten to where we're at now with that program without the assistance of everybody that's in our community. Um, you know, like I said, I there's no way for me to know everything that's going on. And I need that feedback from the public because there's some things that I'm just not going to think about as a biologist. Um, it's just not on my radar. And uh, when people show up to our, our meetings, to our public meetings and say, hey, what about this? You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you don't want people to say no, that they're not in favor with your item. And I'm like, actually, I, I, I enjoy that. I want to know if I'm doing it right or not. I like, this isn't about me. I want to make sure that we're doing right for the land. So um, providing comments to um, local uh, politics is, is vitally important. Um, you know, they always say, you know, you can't do much at the national level, but locally, uh, you can make a huge difference. And, um, you know, there's parts of my uh, fire program, um, you know, as a biologist, I'm not 100% happy. Um, as a fire ecologist, I'm not 100% happy. As a citizen, I'm not 100% happy with the program. But um, holistically, all, all together, I think the, the program is awesome by having the contribution of all the different stakeholders that came in together um, to comment on this program. It's true that the local councils uh, are very receptive to, to what the constituents say. They always want more. It, it, it will, they'll spend quite a bit of time at city council meetings listening to the, pe to the people speak. So that, that is important. So that, that's one thing, join the local nonprofits who are involved in this area is another. Uh, is there anything in your own backyard that people can do? Oh, absolutely. I was just talking to Ann Heppenstall today about, uh, she, she's one of our volunteers and a, and a big native plant advocate. She has noticed enormous changes in her backyard as a result of really taking natives seriously. 
uh, but she's also noticed decline. This past year, she had many fewer bees, uh, many fewer uh, pollinators, and the, her, her backyard is actually well suited to receive them, but she's seeing a decline. Now, if she hadn't spent all that time uh, uh, attending to the garden and making it uh, suitable for natives and pollinators, it'd be even worse. So, you know, uh, lots of native garden, lots of uh, native plants in one's own garden is a, is a good thing to do. It's modest, uh, but it helps. Hmm. Do you have a, a particular plant list that you can share? Is that on your website? I can, I believe it is on the website, but I can definitely put it there. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure Cody and uh, Stuart will will uh, say how important it is that the right plants are in the right place. So. Yeah. Okay, that too. <laughs> yeah, also, you know, if the California Native Plant Society, the Santa Clara Valley chapter is a powerhouse. Okay. They have, they have a native gardening section um, and all that kind of information. And you, you can know, buy kits. There's, there's a group, uh, an operation by Theodore Payne, and he, he sells kits with all, all, the, all the flower seeds you need to, to set up your own native plant yard. Of course, you can always make your home more fuel efficient and you know, drive, drive uh, less gas guzzling cars. All those things are pretty familiar ideas. Meatless Monday, you know, all That's kinds true. of things like that are helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just get out into nature. Mm -hmm. Walk. 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 You know, um, you know, I went to school for you know six plus years to to do my vegetation ecology stuff. Um, I still lean very heavily on the California Native Plant Society for assistance. Um, they are uh, absolutely amazing. The other great one that's really really great um, is the California Native Grass Association. Um, you know. These professional societies um, really do a great service of educating and, and providing all the resources you really need. Um, Xerces Society is another great one um, where you know they can really let you know about uh, what you can do for for monarchs. You know we were talking about that earlier, um, or pollinators in general. So um, you know a simple signing up for an email. From, from these folks um, and getting information, just news and keeping abreast of these um, ecological news, it goes a long way, um, just, just knowing about it. Um, and you won't even realize that it might change your behavior, but um, in the long run, it's going to change your behavior. And, and it's, uh, it's an easy way of doing it. It's just by educating yourself. OK. I've worked a lot with, uh, with the, our tree planting, our partner organization is Canopy. Mm-hmm. So we, we developed a, a tree list that's appropriate, we think, for Los Altos. I've Perfect. got one more comment here. Somebody who really hates the weedy foxtail grasses. Is that on your <laughs> list to try to eliminate? Uh, the, the question about the foxtail? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what happens is annual grasses grow according to the amount of water and uh, nitrogen available to them. And small. So we just, you just generally in urban areas, you can get a lot of annual grass growth. Um, and it, it has a very direct impact on a huge number of Californians because the single biggest allergy issue in California is annual grass pollen. Uh -huh. So the, uh, the nitrogen deposition means there's more grass. If the grass is being limited by water, but there's still a lot of nitrogen around, they make more pollen, very Darwinian there. Hmm. Okay. And uh, so I have a, you know, my tagline is, if you remember the Volkswagen emission scandal where they're cheating, turns out a lot of car companies are doing that. But that, that really is something to sneeze at. I mean, literally, <laughs> you know, every increment of nitrogen in, a, in the environment is creating more annual grass and there's somebody who's gonna sneeze more, so. Hmm. Yeah, the reason to switch to electric cars. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, the electric cars, it's, you know, it's gonna be a revolution. So what else can we ask our city councils to do? Um, infill development. 
cut, okay. you know, stop the sprawl, build up the cities so that we get, you know, livable urban areas that have that critical density for all the cultural things that we like. Yeah, I think one of the one of the bigger threats um, to mid pin lands is uh, further development. Um, uh, not only does it increase fire risk in areas, um, it breaks up our habitat, so habitat conductivity gets broken up. Um, so, you know, really looking at planning laws and, and regulations um, and think being smart about those. Um, you know, the uh, Cal Fire and the science has shown you know, 100 foot of defensible space uh, can go a long ways um, to protecting your house. So if you are building um, on property that you own, um, you know, 30 feet from your boundary, um, how are you getting your 100 foot space? Um, so that's something to think about. So, um, you know, it's um, one of the, the things that people need to remember is uh, when, when we decide that we want to live out in the forest, the beautiful forest, um, the beautiful wildlands, it comes with those risks of fire. Um, and we need to be thinking about that on how are we going to mitigate those sort of problems. And it, the solution um, should not be and cannot be to remove the trees, remove the vegetation. That's the whole reason why lots of these people come out to this area in the first place is for that beaut beautiful natural environment. And so thinking about, you know, how can I make my house more resilient? Mm -hmm. uh, home hardening is much more effective than doing vegetation work um, on protecting your house. So thinking about this and um, in making sure that, uh, you know, when uh, uh, discussions about planning, um, you know, how are uh, the planning departments of your cities going to, going to implement ordinances and such, um, you know, thinking about that, how, how is this going to affect the environment? Um, and what can we do to sort of scale that back um, and mitigate those impacts on an already um, impacted uh, resource? Yeah, just as the, the kind of rural residential sprawl has another really major fire issue in that it impedes the ability to contain the fires because you can't light a backfire if there's a $5 million mansion up the hill. So uh, during the CZU fire, it turns out Pescadero Creek County Park was where they were able to make the stand because there was nobody living there. No they could light the backfires. And there are like dozens of examples of that around the Bay Area in the past five years, where it was the conserved open space where nobody is living, gives the firefighters room to stage and contain the fires. And it's, uh, you know, I, to me, that's like such a great argument for, you know, just keeping it going, you know, that land acquisition and protection by easements. Mm -hmm. So do you think we'll get to the 50? What was it, 50 by 30? 50 by 50? Yeah, yeah, actually. Actually, we, we, we did the math. We looked at the trajectory of uh, land conservation over the past uh, several decades. And yeah, so, you know, the, the line intersects 50% at about 2045. So give ourselves an extra five years. Now, in places like you know, on the peninsula, we're like way ahead of the curve because we've been mm -hmm. at it for so long. You know, those visionaries who who came up with mid pen back in the mm -hmm. early seventies. You know, we are, we owe them. That generation has just set us up great. But in other parts of the Bay Area, you know, like up here in Sonoma County, where I am right now, for a couple days, uh, you know, that they're, they're behind. You know, they're behind. Um, I, I, uh, I, I tried to speak a minute ago, but I was on mute. I'm sorry, I want to step in if I could for a second. I really encourage uh, residents and cities to consider the creek system that they have within their boundary, uh, because the environment is, is connected by water, which flows downhill and through the creek. Everything happens along these creek habitats. It's precious, it's fragile, and if it's not clean and healthy, everything falls apart. 
So uh, for example, in San Jose, we've got major developments that don't even, even observe the buffer zone that's been established by environmental law. We've got projects that are going in way inside of that boundary, right on the Guadalupe River. This is, this is tragic. And uh, it had to start someplace. Uh, you know, San Jose is, is really uh, heavily developed now, but portions of Los Altos are still beautiful and pristine. But let's, let's make the creek system a priority that it's always protected and it's inspected and, and uh, maintained. Creek, uh, creek cleanup projects are wonderful ways to get involved. Uh, every community needs it. And it's a great way to kind of take the temperature of, of your city's health. Yeah, and just the, the restoration of riparian vegetation is actually a really well-developed science at this point. And if you want to like employ a lot of people doing really important work of all skill levels, riparian restoration, it, it just really hits the sweet spot. You know, you have PhD level fluvial geomorphologists. I like the way that rolls off your tongue. <laughs> and then you got the people who are, you know, like doing the ditch digging. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a capital investment in that if you do it right to start with, it's, it's self-maintaining. And all of those benefits we get from healthy creeks will go forward uh, you know, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, forever if we take care of it. So Greentown yeah, has yeah. a program working with others to do creek cleanups. Uh, Greentown has a lot of programs that fit into what you're talking about tonight. Uh, but that one is, uh, we did some things with Permanente Creek and, and, uh, and we're finding that over the years, it's, it's cleaner. It's, there's not as much work to do. Now the creeks yeah. also have an interesting kind of social value in that they connect, they connect communities. Too. So we've been working on Permanente Creek as well. So it, okay. it both goes a long way. And you know, the habitat restoration, the, the creek is a natural classroom too. Uh, it's a beautiful demonstration of how things are supposed to work. So that's why I think yeah. it's- And the, the connection you have, so I used to live right on San Francisco Creek in you know, a beautiful riparian zone. We were far enough away from the creek. It was a, it was a rental, I can't, I don't live there anymore, but you know, uh, when we get a big rainstorm, you know, and the creek would rise, I like felt this connection to, to the land that Cody manages up along Skyline Boulevard. Yeah. That's the upper watershed. And, you know, that, that sense of connection you get to the broader area upstream, if you just start thinking about how creeks work, um, you know, it's, it, it's just an amazing feeling to, you know. Well, if you take, care, are, of, take care of the upper watershed, you're protecting the community down lower, closer to the bay. And, you know, we've got a lot of bayfront uh, habitats in Santa Clara County, much more in San Mateo, uh, but uh, it all ends up in the bay. And so the, the protection of the creeks in turn helps protect the bay, which is crucial for the environment, for the health of the local environment. Yeah, there's a very exciting project going on at Stanford with um, basically taking out Searsville Lake and uh, modifying Searsville Dam so that fish can get upstream because um, the, the lake itself is like 90% filled with sediment hmm. and uh, it doesn't function anymore either the water supply and it never really functioned as flood control. So they're talking about and planning, uh, you know, in deep, they're doing the engineering designs now of putting a hole in the bottom of the dam that will let the water come through, but it's sized perfectly so that it, it starts backing up when you're starting to generate flood risk downstream. So it's like this passive flood control and it's going to be like this amazing, uh, you know, riparian valley that ends up developing in the, you know, once the sediment is flushed out. And then all that sediment's going to go down to the bay where it's desperately needed to, you know, build up marshes in the face of uh, um, sea level rise. So, um, 
you know, it's kind of undoing a really bad decision that was made, you know, 150 years ago. Yeah, you know, people are, are drawn to water. Um, anywhere you go, uh, waterfalls, creeks, lakes, ponds, the ocean, um, it's, it's something that I think just speaks to people uh, when they're near uh, water. And it's just so important to, to protect that as best as we can. And, um, you know, that looks a whole bunch of different ways. It's the, the removal of dams where we need to. It's, um, you know, looking at the invasive species that might be drawing up more water than um, our native species, lowering our water amounts. Um, it's, you know, how much water are we using for broadcast spraying of water onto certain crops? You know, is there a way that we can think about doing these things differently? Um, it's, it's just so important to be t protecting, uh, you know, our watersheds. Um, these are, are um, invaluable not only to us, but to the native uh, wildlife that also call this place home that, you know, we need to share this land with. Hmm. I'm being driven around by the sun coming into this room, and I can't quite get it right. But well, earlier we saw some nice paintings on the back wall, and we can't see those now. Did yeah. you see those? <laughs> yeah, that? Having an art Is that your artwork? No, Is they're that? having an art exhibit up here at the Pepperwood Preserve. Beautiful. Yeah. That was one of the questions, actually, Gary. Did you I know. I, I finally circled back to it. Your hand is up, Elizabeth. Do you have something? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that was, I just, I realized that it's, uh, we're nearing the end, and I just wanted to make sure we got into all the, the questions. Um, yeah. So that was one of them. Do you know the name of the artist, Stuart? That's, that's uh, yeah, I do. I have to go look it up. Um, hold on. <laughs> I didn't mean well, that. while he's looking it up, I would like to thank the three of you. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, join up your with your local nonprofits. Yeah, put a plug in for Greentown there. <laughs> Jim Caldwell. Oh, he's great. Yeah. How do you spell that? Jim Caldwell. Caldwell. C A L D W E L L. Yeah, he's he's been painting a lot. Oh yeah, it's uh, you know, it's the California landscape. You know, landscape painting. Um, there have just been some amazing landscape painters in California, visited California, gone back to, you know, Bierkstadt at the, at the end of the Civil War mm -hmm. and Moran. Um, you know, it's just watching, you know, think, like watching the light fall on the landscape. You know, you get this like oak savanna with the long shadows coming off the oak trees and, you know, the, the gnarled oak trees with you know when they lose their leaves you know it's, it's just you know it's just breathtaking to you know the, the beauty and I, you know i think beauty is like the fundamental value that motivates so much love of nature and it's a pretty mm -hmm. fundamental uh you know it's just a really fundamental emotion that we get from being in places that you know have a full richness of life. Yep. Well, that's a nice that's a nice tie into our current exhibition about beauty and the beast and the, the oh, yes. use of wildlife photography to try to you know capture the imagination. I think what Cody was saying too about the water and uh, drawing people towards it. Art is another way that you can get people to engage with these issues that you know, can feel kind of overwhelming and the science of it can be pretty complicated, but it's nice to have an inroad. Yeah. So um, I wanted to, Gary, I just, I'm, I just wanted for a minute, I wanted to thank uh, Jane Packard, who has been busily putting all sorts of links in the, in the chat. And um, I don't know if, if Jane would be willing to even just if I promoted her to a panelist, if she'd be willing to wave for just a minute. Is she? Yeah, thank is you, that Jane. Okay? That's, that's can I do helpful. that for a second, Gary? Is that okay? Sure. She's, she's active with the, the History Museum as well, and maybe she can tell us a little bit about what she has in mind for the orchard, the apricot orchard. Yeah. I've Jane, been enjoying I'm seeing the links you. pick up. Yes. There, are we going to see her? I'm not sure we're going to see her or not. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Okay. Hi. Jane, Jane, do you just thank you for putting all those links up, Jane. That was a nice little role you played. And uh, Jane is is actually Dr. Jane Packard, who is um, is an animal uh, specialist. So, um, but very, very, go ahead, Jane. Uh, 
I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I just wanted to say that you guys have been really touching on so many aspects of our community that tie together and the things that you've been mentioning today are really, really important. And, and hopefully the museum will provide that leadership with this. Thank you, Gary, for Greentown also providing that kind of leadership. Yeah, my pleasure. Gary, did you see the, also, there's several shout outs to bicycling also, Gary. So uh -huh. oh, that's the music to my ears. I bicycle every day. So, yep. And I, and I lead some bike tours. One is uh, the Lawn Be Gone bike tour where we try to encourage people to put in, uh, take out their lawn and put in natives. So that's mm -hmm. a good one. And the historic bike tour you do. Yeah, that's coming up in September. We go around and look at some of the older homes in town and usually get some of the homeowners to come out and say hi in a few words. So that's always free. So Gary is also our newsletter editor at the museum and uh, we have been having articles in the newsletter and our last article was actually about creeks. So um, that was that was interesting to hear and it brought out a lot of people's memories of when there used to be water much more often in the creeks. So uh, yeah, that was that was by Dr. Uh, Rick Landman and, he, and he's a fascinated by Adobe Creek. He lives in a, in a uh, 1925 farmhouse that's on the banks of Adobe Creek. So he and his, his five boys grew up uh, they grew up maybe not fishing, but certainly being playing in the creek. And the creek, of course, now goes dry large times during the year. But at one time, it flowed, uh, it was perennial, and uh, there were uh, fish and stories of fly fishing for steelhead trout and trout in general. And there was one story recently from Dick Lee who, who drug, dug it up about a, a boy who Cap caught a big steelhead with his bare hands in 1953, right there uh, at uh, Blue Oak Lane. <laughs> so that's about the last time we had yeah, well, water now, flowing long enough for that kind of fish activity in, in our little creek. Now all the lower creek is a concrete trapezoidal. That's town. awful. And that decision was made back in like the 50s. Yeah, we had, we had one bad flood and, and that was the answer. You just get it out of the area as quickly as possible. And you answered the question, uh, Amy Cody's question. You guys, I think you did talk about that one, didn't you, with the, with the foxtail grass? I think you guys yeah. talked. About, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to thank Gary for pulling together this panel and um, to thank all of you so much for your time this evening. I realize it's getting to the dinner hour, and I want to thank how many of our participants have uh, have been here with us through this conversation. It's been fantastic and. Um, we are really grateful for everyone who has come to join us this evening. Um, I would just encourage you to, if you want to find out more about what Gary's up to and you can get our newsletter or of course, any of these great organizations. Did we put a Greentown Los Altos? I think we did. I think a Greentown link got up here. Jane really tried to get every one of your organizations. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Great. So thank well, you all for being part of this tonight. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, yeah, it was a wonderful, you. wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed hearing everybody's inputs, and it, it just reminds me how important it is to think about um, areas outside of your own. <laughs> you know, the, the trees, the grass, the flowers, etc. All things that uh, that I'd like to think more about. So, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. And, you know, if there's one thing that you all can do, um, that is just get out into nature, go for a hike. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things you can do to help out the environment. Excellent. Yeah, good point, Cody. Thank you. All right. I think that's uh, that's a wrap, everybody. Thank you for, for participating. Yeah, good night, everybody. Thank right. you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.